hitting buttons. Oh, hey. 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 <laughs> there, there it is. Calling Chris Anderson. Uh, where are you? I'm uh, in Hurtabis uh, on the Shemin de Dan. So I am, appropriately enough, um, on a Napoleonic battlefield, on a World War One battlefield. And oh, you are you, just you are? so special. Well, oh, I am yeah. here at the Chicago headquarters of History Happy. The Chicago Hour. headquarters? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, back back home again. And, and, and this is our first in, uh, we have four weeks of live shows. Oh, so crazy. Everybody, you know, get get tuned in, get dialed in. Welcome to History Happy Hour, brought to you with the help of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours, which is why Chris is on the road. Uh, this is one of all the many tours that they offer in Europe, the U.S., and the Pacific. You can check it out at stephenambrosetours.com. There you go. And whether you're watching live, or watching on replay, or listening on the HHH podcast. podcast. Thank you for joining us. Today we're going to be talking about one of history's grandest figures. I mean, not Chris Anderson, but the other one, <laughs> Napoleon, uh, and in particular about the Napoleonic Wars. So let us know that you're here and what you're drinking. Uh, Chris, do we have anybody we know joining us today? Yeah, well, Xavier's back, so that's good. Oh, Xavier, uh, welcome. Uh, Jim Stark, uh, Gene Templin. Uh, Jim, Jim Stark's Morgan. already got questions. We have, I know. <laughs> I can jump in the line. We have to go back to those. Okay. Wally Morrison, uh, Jeannie Bo, uh, Steve and Jackie Veets. Hey, uh, Chris, I want to mention uh, I was at a World War II conference last weekend you in were. Gettysburg. That's, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, right. That just completely makes sense. And uh, I met two huge fans of uh, History huge, Happy Hour, uh, Lois and Jim Ullman. They've seen more than 100 episodes. They're probably out there right now watching this one. So, Lois and Jim, if you're there, hey, great to right, see yeah. you. Uh, and uh, we thank you so much. We appreciate everybody who watches, Absolutely. everybody, Absolutely. especially our Patreon supporters. Yes, especially our Patreon supporters. Our Patreon supporters. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and among those, we especially appreciate our top shelf patrons uh, who um, have bought this bottle of um, HHH booze here on the right uh, with their contributions. I, I don't even know what that is. But we appreciate you guys. And if you want to join and be a HHH top shelf patron and help keep the t history tabs open, what's the, what's the website, Chris? www.patreon.com backslash history happy hour there you go that's the one so um <laughs> i guess right uh let us know uh, you're here and what you're drinking and uh uh you know uh we'll we'll get started we i think we have a, a sufficient number of people that we can get started chris so why don't you give me a cue and uh we'll we'll move forward <laughs> Hey, you remember the bell. The bar is open. The bar hey, is open. What's on tap, Chris? Yeah, I mean, um, really kind of super excited about this uh, this book. It's um, we have uh, Alexander Mikabaridze. 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 Oh, see, you say that so much better. Than me. Uh, anyway, and he says uh, it even better. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to ask him too. Um, but he, uh, he, Alex is uh, the author of uh, more than two dozen books about the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, he's written extensively about uh, Napoleon's wars in Russia, uh, some of the Russian personalities. He's a professor of history at Louisiana State University, and we are here to talk about his uh, latest book, The Napoleonic Wars, A Global History, which has been getting all kinds of rave reviews for, for good reason. So we're, I'm very, very happy to have him join us. Alex, welcome to History Happy Hour. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. Yeah, did, yeah, you, bring, did you bring a cocktail or did you just, you know... Let I'm at my go. university office, so I can only drink coffee. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, at least I will say that it's coffee. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I've okay. got a, I've got a beer, and I, I see Chris. You've got a what looked like a glass of wine down there. Have yeah. a have a there you go. So we're we're ready to go. And Chris, you can oh. take it away. Oh, so so Alex, um, just for starters, and I, I may be paraphrasing a bit, but in your book, you talk about the the mass of literature uh, that's been written about the Napoleonic Wars. I think you say something to the effect that you know. Library shelves and bookshelves around the world are groaning under the weight of books about the Napoleonic Wars. Yet you somehow said, "I got to do another one." So, <laughs> so what, what was it that made you say, "I'm going to tackle and, and, that"? And 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 as you answer that question, give us your best guess as to how many books there actually are out there about Napoleon. Well, I'll answer the second, or the first question, and uh, the reason will be arrogance, I guess, youthful <laughs> arrogance. <laughs> well, hang on to the youthful part. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, as for the number, there was um, a guesstimate uh, about 30 years ago that uh, there were about 400,000 books written on this era. Most of it's focused on, on kind of French, Napoleon, Napoleon and French side. So by now, it, it must be well over, uh, well over that number. So maybe uh, close to two thirds of a million. Because the last 20 years have seen remarkable um, growth in the output in, in, in the way we reassess the wars, the individuals, or we kind of shed light on, um, on lesser known um, individuals or, or, or events. But I think the main reason why I wanted to do it, maybe because I'm from a small country uh, of, of Georgia in Eastern Europe. And uh, uh, like all, uh, I think, um, you know, children of the small nations, you want to see your place in the world, right? And so every time I would look at Napoleonic history, Georgia was missing. Uh, and yet I knew from studying Georgian history that um, the, the, the echoes of that conflict had an enormous effect on 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 Caucasus, right? and so ultimately, uh, when I started looking beyond Caucasus and kind of looking at what about the rest of the world, I, uh, I realized that uh, despite thousands of books written on on this topic, I think what is missing is the long term impact that this period had overseas. And so my argument is that as important as Napoleonic Wars was to Europe. Its legacy, actually, especially the long-term legacy, I think, is more pronounced overseas than it is in Europe. I always uh, remind my students that Napoleon ultimately is the loser, right? In, the, in that sense, uh, that he lost Waterloo, his empire is erased from the map of Europe, and then many of the changes that he wanted to implement on the continent were either uh, stopped or, or reversed or certainly constrained. But it is. Um, but if we look broadly especially um, outside Europe, you see that the impact of Napoleon is, is absolutely, uh, or at least Napoleonic Wars is absolutely stunning. Uh, from the end of the European empires in, in the Americas to the creation of the European empires in Asia, to, to the great uh, uh, changes that take place in the Middle East, uh, all across the world, you see the, um, the impact of this period. So I'm not going as far as call it a World War I, uh, but I certainly am arguing that it is a, a period of in, in global history where European squabbles have disproportionately great impact on, on the global scale, far greater than seven years of war. Well, it definitely, and we'll, we'll get into this, it definitely, reading your book, it definitely feels like a world war as you see the impact of what happens on a battlefield in Europe ripple out in your writing to Canada, to the Caribbean, to China, India, the Middle East. Uh, but before we get into that, I, I'm curious uh, how you, uh, growing up in, in Georgia, um, not necessarily known as being a hotbed of Napoleon uh, scholarship, <laughs> uh, how and why did you become, I don't want to say you're a fan, because that would imply you're rooting for Napoleon, but how did you become uh, a Napoleonic scholar. Thank you. I do appreciate you. Uh, uh, I think that new nu nuance that you added to it, because uh, like a, any historian studying a complex period or complex individual, it, it's it. I think it's a, a disservice to simply say you're a fan of something, right? Uh, uh, and certainly uh, something as as complex as Napoleon as a personality or Napoleonic era as a, as a figure. And I hope we'll get into the discussion of Napoleon as as a historical figure. But um, I was uh, a, a young boy, about 10 years old, when um, I went to a bookstore. And there um, on, on the bookshelf was the book, a, a large kind of weighty tome. Uh, uh, that was a, a biography of Napoleon written by one of the uh, eminent Soviet historians. And so for some reason, I, it, it piqued my interest. And so I, I just picked it up, uh, paid the money, and... Um, started reading and that biography is, is, is to the present day one of my favorite maybe it's nostalgia but it, it's very well written and it, it has those elements of both critical historical discussion but plenty of the of of the napoleonic kind of myth right that that gets us all 
I, I tell my students that Napoleon is shrouded by myth, and this myth is like a siren. It, it calls on all of us to, to get closer. And some, some of us get so close that we're consumed by it, but some of us realize that you need to keep a distance and kind of tr uh, a look at, 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 at him and at his spirit at a certain length and then be rational and, and critical minded. But that's how I got it. And I never really wanted to be a his historian as such. I loved history, but uh, my first choice was law. I, I started for, to become a lawyer, finished my degree practiced law and then at one point decided no history is the thing i want to oh, you are crazy <laughs> <laughs> you, you decided that the that you were in law but you decided you looked around and you said the money's in history so that's exactly right. that's, <laughs> my, i think chris you and my wife have have a talk i guess before they, <laughs> because she tells me exactly the same thing <laughs> oh, I hate. Oh. so Alex, what are the this is going to sound really silly um and I, and I apologize but what's the start of what we call the napoleonic wars i mean you know is there a pearl harbor moment or when do, when do you say okay these wars have started and, and these are different than everything that's gone before i think um the the traditional kind of his, from your hist historiography kind of how historians uh, organize the period we we split up the Wars of French Revolution, which began in April of 1792 and lasted until um, 1802, when Napoleon, as part of his peace out kind of peace outreach, was able to negotiate peace all across uh, with all the coalition members. And then from 1802 to spring of 1803, we have a short interlude where Europe is essentially at peace. And then in the spring of 1803. Uh, you have a breach that begins with the conflict between uh, England or, or Britain and France uh, over over fundamental kind of geopolitical issues that they find uh, cannot be resolved. And here, uh, to 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 borrow that famous uh, Thucydian kind of uh, uh, for formula, here you have the rise of one power and the fear that it it engenders in another. Because what happens is that. By the time um, the French Revolutionary Wars are over, France is a is a hegemonic power in the Western Europe, mm -hmm. and peace gives it tremendous advantage over Britain. And so, ultimately, the decision is made, especially in British circles, to uh, to announce a war or uh, to declare war on, on France. And it begins in the spring, in May of 1803, and that is the conflict that will last. Well, essentially, un unremittingly uh, for 12 years, or at least. Uh, until 1814, when Napoleon is first defeated, and then when he returns back, he's defeated again, and the war will finally over in 1815, ushering a remarkable era of about 30 years, 30 plus years of peace in in, in Europe. But how how is this? I mean, I guess where is the break? Why is this not just a continuation of the conflicts between, say, Britain and France before that? Right? I mean. It seems like this is now going off in a different direction. Mm -hmm. No, I, I do make that argument, actually, in my book, that maybe historiography it, it needs to be a little bit corrected. That it, it's convenient to divide uh, them into two different periods. But um, what you see here is the Napoleonic Wars are a direct continuation of revolutionary wars. If nothing else, the hand that Napoleon is dealt, right, this geopolitical hand, is the one that was kind of shuffled and, and, and prepared by the French revolutionary governments. Uh, and, and more broadly, I, I argue in the book that the Napoleonic Wars is in many respects continuation of pre-revolutionary conflicts. Um, uh, and, and then those can go back, we can go back to Louis XIV, because in early 1800s, Europe faces a situation that like the one that it faced at the beginning of the 18th century, when France under Louis XIV is all up, uh, um, up and right, you know, kind of a dominant power that is willing to throw its weight around. Napoleon does the same thing at the beginning of the 19th century. And in both cases, in order to contain this threat, uh, European powers have to form an alliance, a coalition. So in, in Louis XIV's case, it was a grand alliance, right, of European powers. In, in Napoleonic case, it's a series of coalitions that uh, ultimately prevail, although they have a steep learning curve um, uh, until they finally prevail in 1813-14.
So we're going to get into, uh, and I keep promising it, but we're going to get into the, the uh, aspects, the World War aspects of this. But I uh, wanted to ask one question about Napoleon. Um, he uh, um, is uh, in the French army. He's from Corsica. He is uh, rises up and is victorious in Italy. And, and what is it about him? I mean, you've studied him. Uh, uh, in depth, what is it about him that that makes him? You know, he he is a he is a diplomat who can make peace. He is a general who can win all sorts of battles. He doesn't win every one, but he wins all sorts of amazing battles. He is a reformer of the law, creating the Napoleonic Code. Uh, he can be gentle. He can be severe. But w w what what is it that in, that that um, about Napoleon that, that sort of seems to fill the spotlight during this period? Um, he's a very complex uh, human human being and, and probably um, among the most talented that, that we've ever encountered. Um, he has a, um, in many respects, he's a charisma personified. And, and there is certain presence that he has from early on that captivates people uh, General Dominique Van Damme, one of the kind of prominent figures in the French army, uh, a very gruff war veteran, a combat veteran, who uh, says in, in one of the passages that he feared neither God nor devil. And yet he says, I trembled like a child when I approached Napoleon. Right? There's this certain mm -hmm. presence that Napoleon has. Everyone remarked that he has that gray-eyed gaze that was penetrating, that, that could kind of uh, tap to the to the bottom of your soul and yet he has the magnetic appeal he's a man of a powerful personality and a great story right this kind of the story that he in many respects cultivates very carefully the story of rex to riches from nothing to the great uh imperial dominance and then back to to being you know to 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 exile uh, but uh, and certainly he benefits from the fact that he lives in the age of uh, in the in, in romanticism and he's a he's quickly becomes a romantic figure and so m in many respects the public image that we have of him is that of a, uh is that it is crafted by uh, romantics of the 19th century a, a, a tragic figure that right he ends his life on a on a rock in the middle of the atlantic ocean uh, he he certainly uh, milks that that vision because he portrays himself as a prometheus uh, chained to a rock and you know being uh, tortured by by this British vulture, right? Uh, but um, he's a workaholic. Uh, we know that he had a remarkable capacity for work. He has a remarkable um, character traits like photographic memory, ability to retain details so, that are simply staggering. When I was working on eighteen uh, on the trilogy of 1812, kind of exploring his his campaigns in 1812, um, you would see him kind of sitting in Moscow. Uh, um, and, and tracing movement of battalions all across Europe, which, I mean, that requires him to to be able to retain information that flows from acro all across the empire. And th by that time, empire essentially encompasses much of Europe. And he's able to, to, to control and, and to keep track of it. Of course, uh, the reforms that he introduced are important. Uh, these are reforms that in many respects are the reason why Napoleon matters. Not because he fought battles, not because that he, kind of, uh, uh, won wars. Those are, those have an important element in, in themselves. But to me, it's not the military Napoleon, Napoleon as a military figure that is important. But it is Napoleon as a reformer. Uh, his the first four years of him being in in power are probably the most exciting uh, part of him when he introduces the lasting uh, reforms that underpin modern France. Uh, choose any aspect of modern French daily life uh, from legal system to judicial to administrative to financial and you can trace the origins of those uh, of that system to Napoleon. Um, and, and I think uh, Talleyrand, um, he's, he's talented uh, foreign minister, has a wonderful quote when he says that uh, uh, he knows all, he does all he can do anything. And this is, of course, before the, the fall. And, and that was a perception of him, uh, even even among his enemies. Wellington famously portray, you know, f compares him to, on the battlefield, presence to 40,000 men. 
And last, uh, the last point is from uh, that I want to make is from the minister, a really talented minister, Napoleon Suran, um had. In fact, that's one of the I think hallmarks of him is ability to surround himself with capable men, irrespective of their political inclination. So he has people who are Republicans, who are um, uh, regicides, who are diehard monarchists. He he recruits people based on 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 his perception. On, 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 on how he perceives them as talented, committed to the cause. And then one of them is Minister Mole. And um, he, he has this wonderful quote that um, stuck in my head uh, that, where he said that, although Napoleon's common sense amounted to genius, somehow he never quite knew where the possible, uh, where the possible led off. And I think that contradiction where he's a supremely pragmatic guy but ultimately he he's overthrown because he, he failed to find that line where the possible lets off can, can i do one quick follow-up on that chris Absolutely. and then i'll, I'll just I'll, I'll just throw this question from uh, wally morrison who very succinctly says okay talented person what were his faults oh. so give, 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 give us give us 30 seconds or or so on on uh, on his faults there and then we'll move forward oh uh, quite quite a few um he is quite callous. He is quite ruthless. Um, he, um, in in many respects, uh, ignores prudent advice, uh, especially towards the uh, later half of the empire. He is insistent uh, on on following his inner voice, uh, uh, d disregarding very prudent suggestions that his ministers had for him. That includes decision to go to war against Russia, where uh, almost everyone around him cautioned not to, and and even later when. When everyone cautions him, advises him to make a deal and, and accept the conditions that the coalition offers him in, in, in Prague in, 18, in the summer of 1813 and later on in the fall uh, in, at Frankfurt, he, he just refuses to, to be reasonable. Um, so that's uh, one of the problems. Uh, second, um, I think um, he, is, he is driven by the sense of power. Right? He famously has the power is like a mistress to him. And that quest for power uh, a lot, uh, it pushes him to, on, to make decisions or to uh, attempt things that from a modern point of view is, is, is far less power, you know, certainly uh, jarring. Um, we can say that Napoleon uh, is at the forefront of establishing the police state, uh, kind of a surveillance state as, as such. I mean, the, the police system that he develops is quite stunning in its... Uh, reach in its uh, in its ability to penetrate the levels of society uh he can be as i mentioned callous and on many on many occasions he he kind of looked quite coldly at the, at the human misery and, and 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 kept moving forward so i think there are a lot of uh, uh a lot of kind of jarring angles to him that that we should be aware of as, as we we talk about him that the napoleonic legend should not smooth these uh, angles of so, uh, Alex, what you know, we um, talk about the Napoleonic Wars as if it's kind of like one thing. Um, we talk about the Napoleonic era. Uh, you've got a 900 page book that talks about the Napoleonic War. Are people at that time aware that this is not just a continuation of what's gone before? Did it, do they know that this is different? If you had said to somebody mm -hmm. in you know, in Prussia in, in 1806, these are the Napoleonic Wars. Would they have understood what you're saying? Uh -huh. No, because the, the very term actually comes much later. Uh, so, in okay. fact, we, I, as part of this discussion uh, in, in the book, I try to point out that um, when we talk about the term Napoleonic Wars, it, it kind of puts the honors, the, 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 the responsibility for the wars on his shoulders. Right. And yet we don't do that, let's say, for Frederick the Great, right? right. We don't call right. it Frederickian Wars, right? right. Um, and I think um, the term is a reflection of the remarkable dominance that this single individual exercises. But, but it is also true that the conflict was not perceived as such at the time. In fact, if we look at the Russian-Austrian or Prussian uh, uh, kind of perspective, oftentimes they blame British 
for for the for the outbreak of the war, especially on the Russian side. There is a, how appropriate. Yeah, I, I was waiting for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, there is a reason why the prefige is Albion, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tried to tell you, Chris. <laughs> Oh, so, so someone's got a text. So. Yeah, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Alex. Sorry. No, so the the term itself, Napoleonic uh, Wars, comes uh, after the event. So it's a later later creation. Um, uh, for the contemporaries, this was just the uh, Great War. I think mm -hmm. in British, for example, in British experience, uh, this conflict was known as the Great War. In in Russian context um this was known as a struggle against napoleon and later on when napoleon went into russia and became known as the patriotic war or uh, that will be so enshrined in the come in, in popular memory that when world war ii happens right it will be kind of uh, uh, referred to as the great patriotic wars and then kind of parallels to to napoleonic invasion so um no, it, the, the perception is not that this is just, you know, Napoleon rampaging across Europe, right. but that they are complex, complex uh, factors at play. So um, getting at the heart of this book, you write, uh, this is quoting you, Austerlitz, Trafalgar, Leipzig, and Waterloo all hold prominent places in the standard histories of the Napoleonic Wars. But alongside them, we must also discuss Buenos Aires, New Orleans, Queenstown Heights, Rus, Aslandus, Asaya, Macau, Orves, and Alexandria. It's a challenge there. Uh, every time something happens in Europe, your book takes us to Egypt or India or the Caribbean to look how those impacts ripple out. So, so I want to ask you, uh, put you on the spot and say, can you give us one example um, now you can start thinking furiously, and I'll talk a little longer to give you time. <laughs> can you give us one example of how the conflicts in Europe have an impact elsewhere that is generally overlooked? So you can't go with uh, the Louisiana Purchase, because that's the one we know about. But uh, go with you know something that is generally not included in the Napoleonic War experience. Yeah, um, I think one of the good examples will be uh, Trafalgar. Um, uh, so we know that it, it takes place in, in October of 1805, right, as Napoleon is um, on his way to, to his triumphant victory of the coalition. And of course, that sets, you know, it's, it's a part of that uh, rivalry between France and Britain. And in, uh, in, in the popular imagination, Trafalgar is this great victory that ends the maritime struggle between France uh, and, and Britain, essentially. Uh, res, you know, resolved in, in favor of Britain. But the reality is that uh, the struggle continues until 1812. So there is a, the uh, enduring French threat. And more crucially, uh, what I find interesting is what happens in the wake of Trafalgar, because here you see kind of British uh, political military establishment get, getting carried away by the, by the, by the, this, the victory uh, achieved at Trafalgar. Because right in the wake of Trafalgar, we see the attempted invasion of Buenos Aires. Right? This is an expedition that, pop, that is sent, initially sent to South Africa to remove the French presence in South Africa. So that has a direct connection to, 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 to this European right, development. But then from South Africa, Popham, who is in charge of this, of this uh, um, uh, amphibious expedition, uh, is, is sailing to Buenos Aires. And Buenos Aires invasion, of course, is, is, is crucial both because British will be defeated there. Right? That, that's an important uh, story in itself. But also what it gave to the locals, this sense, this newly uh, acquired sense of uh, what it meant to be uh, Buenos Aires and what, does it, what it meant to be a resident of Rio de la Plata at a time when technically you're part of Spanish Empire, but Spanish Empire can't protect you from this from the British because Spanish fleet is at the bottom of Trafalgar Bay. And so the, that story is, is then is, is, is kind of enlarged and becomes even, uh, even bigger when Napoleon decides to take over Spain. Then in 1808, Napoleon removes the Sp uh, Spanish monarchy from power. So now the residents of Buenos Aires have a, have a choice to make. Uh, do they stay loyal to the government, the Bourbon government that was unable to protect them in 1806, do they uh, support the new Bonaparte government, or do they seek a third option, maybe uh, option of independence? 
And so for me, this is a story that is interconnected, that the echoes of Trafalgar can be seen in South Africa, it can be seen in Buenos Aires, and then uh, uh, beyond. And of course, we can we can again look at the. I think I sent you this map with little dots, right, over all all, all over the uh, all over the world. And each of those dots, to me, can be connected to a certain development in in Europe. I don't think I got that map, so I apologize. Okay. No problem. Even even if it's not my fault, I'm apologizing <laughs> because that's yeah, what that. I do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Chris. So, so I, correct me if I'm wrong, but there are seven coalitions that come together to defeat Napoleon? There are seven, uh, but, but I, I do want to point out that the first two are not necessarily against Napoleon as such. Right. The first two are against the French Republic. Uh, right. Although Napoleon is involved uh, in, in, in fighting in the Second Coalition. Okay, well, that, and that'll tie into this. Then, the, Is there something that's different about these coalitions? Does Napoleon and, and this conflict create a different sort of coalition than, than what had gone before it? And... Um, you know, if so, what and, and what does that mean for every you know all these other countries? Each coalition um, is 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 the result or reflection of, of this particular set of circumstances that take place at that junction in time. Um, so, the first coalition uh, began as the uh, as as the alliance between Prussia and Austria, and then grew in size in the wake of the execution of the French king in, in December of in January of seventeen ninety. Uh, three, uh, but uh, one important commonality kind of to these coalitions until the sixth coalition is that even though on paper these coalitions look imposing, uh, uh, in reality, the coalition partners oftentimes acted disjointly, uh, failing to coordinate their moves or unable to bring their forces all at once to the field, uh, to the battlefield where they could inflict uh, the decisive uh, uh, defeat on, on, on the French and certainly Napoleon. And it is only in 1813 that Napoleon and, and France essentially is facing uh, united coalition force. So, yeah, look at, let's say, events of 1790s, uh, right? Uh, so here, the French armies are facing Austrian army or Prussian army. Uh, or they will face occasionally uh, British expeditionary force. Same applies in 1805, right? Napoleon is able to uh, defeat Austrian army, then Russian army arrives, and then he defeats Russian army with the remnants of the Austrians. And then 1806, he defeats Prussian army, right? Even though it's part of this fourth coalition and Prussia so is supported by the British and the Russians, at Jena Auerstadt, it's the Prussian army that is, uh, it, uh, that is hammered. And then Napoleon goes and, and defeats the Russians in, in, in the Polish campaign. But in 1813, what, what happens is that Napoleon is facing a, a combined force of Russia, Austria, and Prussia. Hence why when we look at events in, in the fall of 1813, this is a, a war that is factor different from the one that he previously faced. There is a reason why Leipzig is the largest battle uh, before World War I right, in Europe. Um, that that battle has well over half a million men fighting in, in, in and around the city over over three days. And here Napoleon is facing the combined forces of Sweden, Russia, Austria, and Prussia. So it's a massive coalition that he's confronted. Um, uh, and so the, that, that is a reflection of the coalition partners kind of learning how to confront Napoleon. Part of this learning curve it was to figure out what made the French system so effective. So you see, for example, in the wake of defeats at Austerlitz, at uh, Jena, and, and then later on Friedland, that these defeated coalition partners are, are trying to emulate the French and borrow parts and parcels of their system uh, to, to, to improve their uh, military capacity. So artillery reforms in the Russian army take place after Austerlitz. Um, Aust of course, Prussian military reforms start in 1807 in the wake of the uh, of the devastating defeat at the Jena Auerstadt. And then in 18, um, at the same time, Austrians are reforming their military in 1805, 1806. They will try to confront Napoleon in 1809. They will lose, so they will again have to kind of go back to drawing board and, and, and see what needs to be improved. By 1810, 11, you see, for example, Russians borrowing core system 
that French if uh, used so to such a deadly efficiency on the battlefield. So in 1813, the armies that Napoleon is facing are fundamentally different, at least in terms of how they move, how they command it, how operationally, right? On this operational level, they are fundamentally different from the ones uh, France faced in 1792. Mm -hmm. I want to remind everybody that we're chatting here with uh, Alexander Mika Baridze, who's the author of The Napoleonic Wars, A Global History. How to do in the name, Alex? There, there you go. He's, he's not uh, You did. Yeah, you clearly yeah. practiced, right? Okay, I, I, that's, that's all I'm doing while well, you're talking is practicing saying your name. You got bonus points for it. Uh, <laughs> and, and I want to uh, bring in, we, we have many, many comments uh, and Excellent. questions going on. And I want to bring in some of that. And I want to, we have a kind of an ongoing discussion uh, uh, that's taken place here in the chat column about whether uh, the Napoleonic Wars were a world war, and a comment that comes up from David Picker is, it was a world war, as the Seven Years' War was, a war fought on three continents and all oceans qualifies as a world war, I submit. So where are you on this uh, on this question? Um, yes, that's a, that's a great, I think it's an ongoing debate, uh, so I'm not sure my, my, answer, my answer will necessarily settle it. But the way I look at it is that uh, this is a European conflict uh, uh, that is unfolding on a global scale. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean world. So you're basically world. trying to have, you know, you know, have both. <laughs> yeah, no. The, the reason I'm saying is that it, it certainly doesn't, um, in terms of mobilization of the kind of on the world scale, China has negligible involvement. It, it has, you know, the the wars affected. But certainly, Chinese military is not involved. Same applies in Japan. The wars affect parts of Japan, but uh, the uh, Japanese army is not necessarily directly involved like it would be in World War II, right? Um, same applies for for Africa, right? Uh, parts of Africa are significantly affected by by this war, but uh, but much of it, right? If you've been um, uh, in Timbuktu or if you are somewhere in, in in South Central uh, Africa, chances are you you went along with your life without really necessarily uh, ever hearing about this conflict. Um, but I, my argument is that it is again it's a European uh, conflict on a global scale, and in terms of intensity and scale, that it dwarfs anything that preceded it. It's, it's far bigger in scale and intensity than Seven Years' War, bigger than the War of Austrian Succession. It has a, a far more pronounced effect on North America, on South America, on, on Asia, on Middle East, uh, and so in that in that sense, it's 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 more intensive. So, so you know, there is there is so much uh, in, in your book that you know caused me to sit back and go, "Wow, I, I really hadn't thought about that." Um, so it, you know, obviously, we're, we're kind of limited by time, but one of the things that um, it caught my, my eyes i'm reading through it is, is of course uh, the invasion of russia um and that for somebody with you know a bare um, bare bones knowledge of uh, the napoleonic wars the classic story is everything's going great for napoleon and then he goes to the russia and it snows and he loses and it's all downfall from there um but in reading your book you, you were saying that you know you know when he comes back from russia it, it's bad but he he can marshal a force and and things you know, he thinks that we can turn this around. So, uh, do we make too much of the invasion of Russia, or or what should we no, do with um, that? No, I don't think we made too much of it because it it, it is a massive blow uh, to the empire. Um, that that Napoleon, short term, manages to recover, and and he certainly came very close to um, turning the tide in the spring of 1813 when he scores, uh, you know, one two punch blows on, on the uh, Russians and Prussians at, at uh, Lutzen and Bautzen. But I think here what, what he's confronted with is the reality that the coalition partners have improved sufficiently that he can't simply f end the war through a military victory. The mm -hmm. war requires a political solution. And that political solution eludes him partly because, and I would say maybe even, you know, lar you know the lion's share, because he is unwilling to compromise. Mm. Uh, that is especially to me um, uh, evident in the summer of 1813 during the armistice at Pleschwitz, where the Allies, especially Austrians, are willing to 
um, negotiate with him to find a way to end this conflict. But the uh, but the ending will be certainly not necessarily in favor of of, of Napoleon. But that's what happens when you lose the war on, on a scale that, uh, that he did in in Russia, right? If, if yeah. you lead more than half a million men, and most of them don't make out and not necessarily dead, but so you know, well over 150,000 soldiers were uh, kept in, in as prisoners of war in Russia for until 1814, right? So, so this is a massive loss of of life. Uh, it's massive loss in terms of equipment. Um, uh, next to the human life, uh, the the next big blow that Napoleon experiences because of the loss uh, in in Russia is in horses and artillery. He loses more than quarter million horses that simply cannot be re uh, replenished that quickly. So hence why in 1813 he time and again uh, is unable to deliver the coup de grace, right? the, the, the decisive blow. Artillery problems also cannot be resolved in, in, in short term. And so that all should have pushed him towards seeking a political compromise, seeking a mm -hmm. polit political solution. And time and again he refused because he believed that the empire it was based on that military glory, on the military power, and in the compromise would endanger it. But I, I uh, you know, in hindsight, I disagree with that. Uh, that I think he could have easily negotiated with with the allies and found a, a political solution to it. Yes, it would have been unpalatable to him, but it would have benefited France far more than what ultimately happened. Mm. So, uh, bring in another question. It's, it's another one from Wally Morris, and Wally's scoring today. Uh, so, uh, how much of Napoleon's battlefield success was luck versus deliberate strategy versus the heroism of his troops? Um, that's a great question. Thank you, Wally. Um, in every war, you need to have a luck. So, I'm not going to say that you know, luck played no, no, no uh, role in this. And I think, um, let me kind of maybe drill in on, on the most famous of Napoleon's battles and, and, and give you an example of it. And that's, uh, that's Austerlitz. We know that Napoleon uh, prepared very well for that battle, right? In the weeks leading up to the battle, he visited the battlefield, he scoured the terrain, he knew what to expect on a given day uh, in terms of weather condition, the, the, the famous fog, he uh, he made ma uh, uh, kind of exploited to the maximum the military that he had. Um, the fact that he could give an order to his marshal, Marshal De Vu, who was in in Vienna, and to tell him that he has to march some seventy six uh, uh, miles in forty eight hours, and be confident that those men will be actually be able to arrive on time. That is a testament to this military machine that he creates. But on the other hand, and this is where luck is, when I and I wrote uh, my my last book is the biography of uh, Russian Field Marshal Kutuzov, and in that book I break down the other side of the coin. Right, I say, oh, so here's what Napoleon did. Now le let's look what the other side is doing. And there, what you see is that the Allies almost deliberately making all the mistakes that were needed for Napoleon to succeed. So that's where, indeed, luck plays a role. Here you have uh, a, 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 an army that is led by a czar and the emperor who've never commanded an army before, who are surrounded by officers who have never experienced uh, a, a battle before, uh, all of them encouraging their leaders to, to march on. Here's Alexander. This is his first battle. And he's surrounded by a posse of psycho fans who all tell him how awesome he is, that he this, this battle, he will win things hands down, and yet the men who've been to war, the men who have the first-hand experience of, of what it means to be on the battlefield, like the the protagonist of my book, Kutuzov, who urges retreat, who urges methodical approach to war, uh, are all shunned to the side because it's not heroic enough. And so Austerlitz to me is a, is a great example of both Napoleon as a brilliant uh, commander who can for we see what the enemy sh might do but there is no denying that he was lucky that the enemy did play exactly as he anticipated so alex you know 
there are, there are a few people that have spent so much time with the emperors you have. I mean, there's some, but you're kind of up there. Um, what is it that, given given how much has been written about him, what is it that we don't know about him, or what is it that you think um, sort of you know, popular perception misses about this figure? Well, um, <laughs> um, short answer will be we know him quite quite well, and in yeah. fact, that's one of the reasons I recently was asked to write a, 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 a yet another biography of Napoleon, and I said no. Um, <sighs> Uh, might be an easy subject in terms of right, kind of producing a, a quick, uh, a concise biography. But I think there is plenty of of those around. Mm -hmm. We've uh, we have um, uh, really a, a embarrassment of riches in terms of Napoleon a biography, especially in the last ten years. Uh, you see biographies by Andrew Robert, by Philip Dwyer, by Michael Broers, and we are not talking about a small bag. I'm not even mentioning small ones. I mean, these right. are massive volumes. Philip Dwyer's and Michael Brewer's biographies are three volumes each. Um, so I think there is a lot that we know of, of Napoleon as, as such. What is missing, however, is, is sides of, of, of his policy. Uh, mm -hmm. Before the, we started this interview, I, I mentioned that one of the projects I'm working on is this right, intersection of money and power. So mm -hmm. my interest is, well, what was... How was Napoleon able to fund all these wars? What's mm -hmm. the financial system that underpins the war effort? Uh, what's his relationship with the financial sector, you know, with the great banking houses, right? And that is not necessarily uh, examined uh, uh, to sufficient degree. Uh, there is, a, for example, again, if we stay on Napoleon, uh, we still need a, a substantive reassessment of the colonial policy that Napoleon engaged in, right? So that's, uh, we know that he attempted to revive the uh, French colonial empire, but what are the specific policies that he pursued? Mm -hmm. I think that that's important. Uh, even in the continental system, right? Uh, we have uh, um, old studies, but I think there is much to be done in terms of uh, re-examining continental system, not continental blockade. We oftentimes confuse these two concepts, but blockade is more kind of uh, uh, narrow, narrow focused on the British embargoing British trade. Continental system is far more encompassing. We, we, he, this is a system that envisions creating a new political economic reality in Europe, and uh, that needs to be done. I think again uh, with the fresh approach, with based on the sources that we now know uh, are available, uh, and and those are the kind of elements that Napoleon's story is missing. Mm. And one last point is that. Uh, I think there is a dictonomy between kind of, or they got a difference between a scholarly uh, vision of Napoleon that is quite critical of him, and rightly so, and a popular image of, of him. I experience that every time I teach course of Napoleon, where students come with Napoleonic legend. Right? In mm -hmm. they, Napoleon is a romantic hero. There's a legend that is that is is deeply ingrained, and one I think angles of his story is kind of chipping at this um, at, at this legend and, and showing the real man uh, behind the legend behind the myth so um, uh, we have a ongoing uh, I've just been reading some of the comments as we're going on there's a, 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 a lot of a lot of comments happening here but um, I, I want to ask about uh, the the end of Napoleon's military career. He he is defeated, and then is in the classic story here. He crosses over from Elba to France. He he offers himself to the French troops that confront him. You know, shoot me, and they don't. Um, and then and and then comes the Hundred Days campaign that ends in Waterloo, where the where the British defeat him. Where where very famously the British <laughs> just throw defeat that out Napoleon, and I think I think Arthur. Wait Wellesley. a second! I do want to point out that British. <laughs> I think Arthur <laughs> Wellesley <laughs> is involved. And no, there's, there's, <laughs> I was waiting for that. Luke is there. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna shout out to my. Dutch and German yeah. friends. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like where you're going with this, Alex. I like where you're going with this. But did he have, was there any chance in this 100 Days campaign of him succeeding? Or was this just kind of a, uh, I'm going for the glory and letting it happen. And, you know, maybe there's a one in a thousand chance. But was there any real chance of his being successful there? I, I don't see it. And, and, and I, I know some of my colleagues disagree. And But I, I, I see that, you know, 
any any vision of Napoleon surviving in 1815 is is not supported by by contemporary sources. Um, Napoleon, um, you know, when he comes back uh, in, in in March of 1815, he promises peace. He promises that he wants to live in kind of in, in peace with the rest of Europe, and that he 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 would not engage in in any aggressive uh, activity. But you know, he he made the his choice of timing was quite weird in that he returned, he escaped from Elba when Congress of Vienna was still meeting. And uh, that meant that all of his enemies were essentially in one place and that they could simply get in the room and craft a policy, craft a strategy against him. And one of the first things we see as soon as the news of him escaping reaches Vienna is the uh, desire is, is an announcement that the Cong the coalition uh, will be revived and that they will fight against him. In fact, if we look at the announcement of the declaration of the war that the uh, that the powers issued, it's actually a, a declaration of war against a single man. And they, they are careful to uh, specify that they are not fighting French people. This is not a war as such against France, but it is against Napoleon. Uh, and so I cannot see how in, in, in that reality, when all, 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 all the great powers were determined to remove him, power, how he could have survived. Yes, there are some people who suggest that, you know, that he could have won at Waterloo, you know, that, yes, in Wellingtonian description, it was a close run, right? But even if he had won at, at Waterloo, we know that there were half a million Austrian and Russian troops on the way to France. and. He would have found his Waterloo, right? His quote unquote, at some other small Belgian village or maybe a village somewhere in the Rhineland. Um, the coalition was determined to remove him. It, it's it's not the same that they were, you know, they were determined to undo Napoleon necessarily the reforms that he introduced. In fact, if anything, we know that, um, you know, they allowed France to retain, mo you know, the system that Napoleon introduced. Right? That's where Napoleonic legacy it really survives in, in France because the coalition was not keen on undoing his reforms in France, but they simply could not tolerate him. Well, yeah, I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, so, I mean, one of the things that I've always wondered about, uh, and there may not even be an answer, but what is it that he wants? I mean, is there an end state? Is there, is there a is he driving towards a point, or is it just, you know, the the quest for power? The the you know, what what is it that keeps him going, or keeps France going, even? You know, I think um, in in the book I'm arguing that what Napoleon has in mind is, is this concept of universal empire, um, and that is a, a, a reality where uh, he creates a, a, a new political economic sphere in Europe right? and, and he comes very close to to pulling that off mm -hmm. um, it's it's later on at St Helena Island right he he talks about a vision that he wanted to fulfill of the United States of Europe right? As in, but what he means here is essentially creation creating a, a, a political economic reality where Europe is united and he has a one set of laws and at no point did Napoleon or anyone else actually or in France, considered that the French system is um, is in, in inferior to any uh, to any other. In fact, one of the remarkable things about um, kind of uh, Napoleonic imperialism, you know, when we deal kind of uh, with regards to relationship to the other uh, uh, states, is that the French all were convinced that their system was better. That the, it was inherently better, and, and and that Napoleon's commanders, governors, prefects, auditors, they all believed that what they were bringing was an improvement, improvement on local systems, on local laws, on local taxes, on local administration. It was, I mean, they all perceived this as, as, as agents of uh, mission civilisatrice, right? that they would benefit the people that they were occupying. Uh, in the book, I, I mentioned uh, the the great quote from uh, Marshal Mortier, who in 1806 occupies the German city of Kassel, and and he issues a proclamation, and in that proclamation he says, "I've come to occupy your land, 
you have nothing to expect but improvements. <laughs> you guys suck. <laughs> We're bringing better system. We're bringing better laws. We're bringing uh, better administration. And and in many respects, right, in many respects, th they are right because Napoleonic system is more streamlined. It's more efficient. It's it, it has many advantages, but of course, it comes at the expense of imperial Im, imperialism. It comes at the expense of occupation. But the vision is is that of a of a sphere that is dominated by France. And, it, and I've read through almost uh, you know the entirety of this new set of uh, Napoleon's correspondence, over forty thousand letters in it. And if you read through eighteen or post eighteen o five. The, uh, correspondence of Napoleon, you see the same thread that you know, he wants to make France great. Mm -hmm. Almost had to say great again. By, <laughs> by <that religion. laughs> uh, he constantly refrain, refrain, uh, kind of refers to France above everything, France above everyone else. Uh, so this would have been a, a kind of a vision of European Union, but dominated by France, ruled by French laws, uh, French currency as the as a currency uh, of exchange. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean freedom of market, because I think this is where Napoleon uh, is, is, was a, quite a, a thorough mercantilist. He, create, he envisions this universal empire serving French economic interests, and he creates within the continental system kind of two-tier system where France can trade with everyone else, but everyone else has kind of barriers to how they conduct trade. But that's the vision he has uh, in, in, in Europe. And if I've had an uh, audio problem, so I can't hear anybody here. But uh, uh, am I interrupting you, Alex? Yeah, I, no, I'm, no. I'm so sorry. Uh, I was just going to uh, throw out a last question, which yeah. was uh, give give you thirty seconds on this before we go. Which is, I, I, you know, th as you may have heard, there's a new uh, movie about Napoleon uh, by Ridley really? Scott. Do you really? have your tickets yet? Are you looking forward to this, or are you dreading it? Um, I'm actually hosting a premiere. Uh, we have a wonderful film center here, and uh, I've uh, talked to the um, the administration. We are hosting a premiere that week, so when it's released. So, uh, yes, I'm ex very excited to go, but with with uh, a lot of trepidation because the trailer um, has a lot of problems. In it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll we'll, uh, we'll we'll maybe we'll we'll touch base with you after you've seen it and get a get a report that we can put uh, we can we can put online to our. To our fans, but we want to thank you so much, Alexander so Mika Beridze, yeah. uh, author of the Napoleonic Wars: A Global History. Uh, really, a fascinating discussion Absolutely. today. It's fantastic, guys! Thank we, you, gentlemen. We, uh, it was a, an honor to be here, and I really appreciate your time. Thank yeah, you so I, much I, for joining us. Read the book. There's just so much in it. Uh, yes, it's, it's 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 full of excellent stuff. Thank you so so much. Thank you, Alex. Uh, so I did manage to, to disconnect audio, yeah, but it wasn't my own audio. Final question, and then you just did you have you were going in with the final? No, you he was answering, and then you just like kind of ask him about this. I I thought he was done. I was I couldn't hear anything. Mm. I was you know I was like the admiral at uh, on the Yamamoto at um, Midway. <laughs> I just oh! screwed up. How do you how do you remember that transition? I, I just screwed up. But speaking of midway, <laughs> <laughs> next week we'll dive back into World War II with an emphasis on the word dive. Uh, <clears throat> we'll be talking about submarines at Midway with Mark Allen, who's the author of the new book Midway Submerged. Uh, and submarines are usually considered a sideshow at Midway. And I, you know, I mean, the aircraft carrier battle was the big deal, but they were an integral part of the Japanese attack and the U.S. defense of Midway Island. And we will get into that, Chris. We will. We will. Okay. We will okay. totally get into that. Uh, guys, please subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook. Shout at us on Twitter. Listen to our podcast. Back us on Patreon and browse all those old shows at historyhappyhour.com. Thanks, everybody. Be safe.